afternoon to everyone. Um, let me start actually by saying that um, Chris might not remember this, but in early 2009, Chris organized a panel at um, University of California Riverside on the crisis. And you remember that um, 2008 was the big financial collapse and there was the onset of the crisis. And, it, and he invited me to speak on this panel and it was actually then that I started giving serious thought to the issue of global crisis. And ever since then, from 2009 until uh, currently, I've been pretty much focusing my work and my thoughts and as well as my political attention on the issue of the global crisis. But I started out thinking about uh, the crisis in terms of its economic and its financial dimensions. And from there, I went on to start thinking of the largest social implications, um, ecological, political, uh, racial implications, and you know, the, the overall implications of the crisis. Um, and so I want to talk about a little, a little of them, not so much the economic dimensions. Uh, and you know, specifically, the question I put forth to myself at the beginning is, what type of a crisis are, are we in? Are we in a cyclical crisis, by which I mean crises that in the economic system that come once every 10 years or so, um, and then correct themselves? Uh, are we in a larger structural crisis, a crisis that in order to get out of it really requires a whole restructuring of the system? Um, and we see that once every 40 to every 50 years or so, these big restructuring crises. Or are we in something bigger, a systemic crisis? A systemic crisis meaning that there's no way out within the existing system of the crisis. And I, don't, I know it's not a cyclical crisis, I would assert that, but it's not clear to me if we are in a structural or a truly systemic crisis, or if a structural crisis is going to, is snowballing now into a systemic crisis. In any case, more recently, I started writing and publishing about the, the economic dimensions of the crisis in 2009, 2010, 2011, and I turned my attention now to these other um, dimensions, the issue of social control, um, um, social control and sort of what I've been encapsulating under the title of global police state, and policing global capitalism. And when I say policing global capitalism, I'm taking my inspiration here from a book that I had read way back when it came out in 1978, and then I reread it uh, when this crisis broke out just a couple years ago, from cover to cover, it actually a new edition just came out, uh, by Stuart Hall, who just passed away, as you know, a couple, couple weeks ago, uh, and his colleagues, and the title of that study was Policing the crisis. They were talking about the, the UK and the crisis of the 1960s into the uh, into the 1970s, and they show how um, there was a restructuring of capitalism in the UK and by extension the then you know industrialized countries uh, in response to the 1970s crisis that was leading in the in the UK to what they called an exceptional state. When they said exceptional state, they were drawing on Nikos Poulantzis description of an ex exceptional state, characterized by the ongoing breakdown of consensual mechanisms of social control and this shift towards authoritarianism. So when I reread the book, um, you know that book, I said, this is what's going on currently, but this time at a global level. Um, and they're good Gramscians. Paul and his colleagues took a Gramscian perspective, and they wrote the following. Uh, so when I read this, chillingly, this is, can describe the global situation at this time. They wrote, this is an extremely important moment, the point where the repertoire of hegemony through consent have been, ex have been exhausted. The drift towards the routine use of the more repressive features of the state come more and more prominently into play. Here the pendulum within the exercise of hegemony tilts decisively from that where consent overrides coercion to that condition in which coercion becomes, as it were, the natural and routine form in which consent is secured. The shift in the internal balance of hegemony, consent to coercion, is a response within the state to increasing polarization of class forces, real and imagined. It is exactly how a crisis of hegemony expresses itself. The slow development of a state of legitimate coercion, the birth of a law and order society. The whole tenor of social and political life has been transformed by this moment. A distinctively new ideological climate has been precipitated. So that's what they wrote in 78. And in my view, this then becomes an accurate description, really, of the current state of global affairs. And we're, in fact, I suggest to you, witnessing transitions around the world already from social welfare to social control states. But at the same time, and going back to this question of whether we are in a structural crisis or a deeper systemic crisis, uh, the crisis that we're in at a global level is much more grave, much more serious than earlier structural crises, the ones that we could identify in the 1970s that led them to 
write this book, the one in the 1930s, the one before then in the 1870s, um, the plight of humanity is really at stake in a much more serious level this time around, which is exactly the title of my last publication on this topic, Global Crisis, Capitalism, and the Crisis of Humanity. And why do I say that this crisis is much more serious for the whole plight of humanity <coughs> uh, this time? Well, there are six novel dimensions to this crisis. There's certain dimensions which share uh, structural features with early a big crisis <coughs> we've had, but this one has also six novel dimensions. And I want to go through them. And one of them is that we're fast reaching the ecological limits of the system's reproduction. We've already reached what the environmental scientists call tipping points. They identify nine planetary boundaries. We go beyond these boundaries, not just human life, but life it basically goes extinct. And we've already gone beyond the tipping point in three of them, the nitrogen cycle, uh, climate change, and uh, biodiversity. And there's another four where we're approaching the tipping point. So this dimension cannot be underestimated. We might have been destroying the, uh, you know, the, our biosphere in the 1970s and 1930s, but it was never reaching these tipping points until now, 21st century. Second novel dimension of this crisis of humanity is just looking at the sheer magnitude of the means of violence and the means of social control and the magnitude of control over global communications, over the production and the circulation of symbols and of images and therefore of meanings and therefore interpretations of what we're experiencing in the world. Um, and the concentration of those means of violence and those means of communication and symbolic production in the hands of very, very small groups. Um, and so this is really a very frightening dimension um, uh, of this crisis that we're facing. It allows for new systems of social control and repression that we've really never seen before. Uh, the world of Edward Snowden is really the world of George Orwell. 1984 is now here, but even we've gone even beyond 1984. Uh, and so we see worldwide a restructuring of space through new technologies and new systems of social control that allow for the establishment of global green zones. Wherever you go now, you can create green zones where the rich and the powerful and the privileged are protected in this restructuring of space and these systems of social control. Um, prison industrial complexes, where we know in the United States, an extremely important book that has come out is uh, the new Jim Crow, many of you are probably aware of that, but the, the system of prison industrial complexes and criminalization and militarized control of marginalized populations is now universalizing. Um, uh, immigrant repression. Uh, and then, of course, again, to reiterate, the means, it's not just the means of violence, but the means of, the, of um, communication and production of symbols and meanings. So you have um, media and ideological apparatuses and cultural industries in the hands of the, what I call the transnational capitalist class. Uh, and in the hands of states with a hegemonic control that we've never seen before. And this is what I'm saying, it's, in the society, the society of Edward Snowden is really the society of 1984. Uh, Hollywood, the, the impossibility of distinguishing in Hollywood between fact and fiction now becomes normalized at a level of mass uh, psychology. And uh, just look at what is going on in Venezuela, where the images that you receive about what's going on in Venezuela, and those of us who know what's actually going on in the ground, and the gap between the two is so enormous that it's unfathomable. Um, and so the inability to think critically outside the dominant worldview now becomes more and more uh, <coughs> difficult. Uh, I remember this slogan from the mid-19, started in World War II and was very popular in the mid 20th century, which was, I think as I please, meaning you can repress me with your, you know, chorus of apparatuses from outside, but you can't control what I think inside. But that's not even true anymore. So that's the, the second dimension, you know, of this crisis. <coughs> the third is there's this, these limits we're reaching to the extensive expansion of capitalism as a cis global system in the sense that there's no longer any new territories of significance to be integrated into world capitalism. Uh, Deruralization is now well advanced. The commodification of the countryside is a sweeping process all over the world. Uh, pre and non-capitalist spaces have been integrated, um, converted hothouse fashion into spaces of capital. So that intensive expansion has re reached these deaths around the planet never before seen. And the capitalist system is like a bicycle. If you stop pedaling the bicycle, the bicycle tips over. If capitalism stops expanding, uh, it crashes. 
And so the big question I'm asking myself in looking at this crisis is where now is capitalism going to expand? I mean, it's extensive expansion has nowhere to go. Its intensive expansion is already reaching, you know, penetrating cultural systems, and as I've been describing, ideological systems, there's no spaces intensively or, in, or extensive. Those are contradictions of the system. And so this is a new battleground. You know, the, the urban peripheries, Mike Davis writes about this, we need to go deeper. The urban peripheries now is where surplus humanity have been pushed out of the countryside and not incorporated into the uh, healthy life of cities, uh, inhabit the planet of slums in the urban peripheries. And these are the new battlegrounds, of course, for resistance. Here, in this presentation, I'm looking from the top down and trying to analyze power. But from the bottom up, that's also where we want to be uh, looking at. But the point from the top down is that here's where the new systems of repression and social control are most massively hammered down onto the, onto the urban peripheries and onto the, the, um, the surplus humanity. To the point, of course, where genocide is popping up. When you look at the Congo and you say that six million people have been killed in the Congo in the last 10 years, there's no you know, global outcry. And this is a population which has been, is part of surplus humanity. Or you look at how Somalia, it's a link of that to the issue of ideological, you know, the mass media and Hollywood and ideological control and, and um, uh, consciousness, the way Somal Somalia is portrayed, a population subject to genocide, subject to destruction by global capitalism, and then portrayed as pirates and crazed Islamicists and so forth. Um, so that's the fourth. There's actually five, I didn't mean to say six, five novel dimensions I want to touch on. The fifth, is that there's this disjuncture between a globalizing economy um, and a nation state based system of political authority. What I refer to as transnational state apparatuses, uh, they're incipient, they have not been able to play the role of what we call uh, a hegemon, a, a leading power that organizes and stabilizes the system in terms of a nation state. Um, um, and transnational state apparatuses are too incipient to exercise the political authority that could regulate uh, global capitalism or rein in on the unbridled power of transnational capital or the anarchic tendencies uh, built into the system of global capitalism. So, so that's another internal contradiction that we, again, did not see. We started seeing in the 70s, the 70s that led to globalization, the crisis of the 70s, but previously states could and political authorities could attenuate these crises, these structural crises, as well as the, the cyclic crises. So the big question is, to move towards a conclusion, um, how do we get out of this crisis? Uh, again, I haven't answered, and I can't answer whether we're moving from a structural to a systemic crisis. It would certainly look like it. Um, but then the big question, either way, is how do we move forward? How do we address this crisis? And of course, the answer is twofold, because I mean, there's two ways of answering. One is from above, how do dominant groups looking at this crisis? How could they, or how are they proposing to address it? Or do they care to address it? Um, and then the other is from below, popular forces, the mass of humanity from below. How do we address this crisis? So from above, I, I would say the following, and let me just pause. I have five minutes or so. You do. Good. Um, so from above, um, one part of the transnational elite has been putting forth, I mean, I'm not going to respond to that section of transnational elite that just says more neoliberalism, more global capitalism. Just leave that aside for the moment. A more enlightened transnational elite has been putting forward these reformist proposals for quite a while now. Uh, we spoke about this back in the panel in, in Irvine, uh, so Riverside. Um, but but here's the thing: the the, the the reformist proposals rest first of all on neo a neo keynesian redistribution, and that's very problematic. Neo keynesian redistribution of wealth through the same mechanisms that used to take place in a, at a nation state level, keynesian nation state. Level. But how do you redistribute transnationally when, there, when, when, again, to go back to that disjuncture, there's no political authority that can intervene in the circuits of global capital to force a redistribution downward at a worldwide level that could at least attenuate the economic and the, um, some of the, you know, the worst dimensions of social polarization and immiseration, uh, and also reactivate a global a productive face to the global economy. How do you do that transnationally? Uh, there's no solution. But the biggest problem with the neo-Keynesian uh, project at a global level is ecological. It's that there's this implacable juggernaut of global capital accumulation. Uh, and so, I mean, even if you reactivated productively the global economy through things such as 3D manufacturing and nanotechnology, which are the two cutting-edge technologies that could bring about a shift 
from global speculative economy to a global productive economy. Even if you did that, it wouldn't resolve the ecological holocaust that we're in the midst of here. And in fact, the reactivation that we've seen in the United States, you know, we're talking about we're, we're overcoming the crisis, all the signs are improving, which is a lot of nonsense anyway, but the little bit of productive reactivation has been and regrowth in the, you know, in the U.S. economy um, has been on the basis of an expansion of oil and natural gas, which in turn has been on the expansion of fracking. So, so you know, we're still headed, we're accelerating our headlong drive into ecological holocaust with this, and so this transnational project from above of, you know, neo-Kinesianism is, I don't see it as, as a solution at all. And therefore, having, and at the same time, uh, right, so even if it were, it's not viable, but, and, and the fact is that the, such a redistribution in any case is not taking place. And so the social contradictions are all heightening. And hence, we're likely to see, or we are seeing, I, I don't want to see this, we don't want to, but we are seeing, rather than consensual domination, or that is attempts to resolve this crisis through hegemonic incorporation, we are seeing uh, an extension of coercive exclusion, and then those new, these new systems of transnational social control being applied um, through coercive exclusion of the world's first surplus humanity, and then all those sectors that would resist um, these intensified contradictions of the, that the crisis is raising. Uh, so this raises a series of sub-themes that I can't get into here. I want to, uh, I'm just going to mention the sub-themes without discussing them in any detail. But I want to mention the in, especially in the United States and European countries, the extreme racialized nature of these, of the, these, um, of this coercive exclusion. Um, but the other thing is that when you turn to coercive exclusion as the strategy for addressing the social dimensions of the crisis, rather than hegemonic incorporation, here you're giving a big boost to militarized accumulation, which is another th sub theme that I've been elaborating on. That it becomes built into the system that militarizing the global economy, militarizing social and political relations worldwide, um, expanding a prison industrial complex, expanding immigrant detention systems, uh, expanding US and, and interventions and wars wherever you can launch them, become independent of geopolitical or political objectives. They simply become ways of accumulating capital in the face of stagnation. Uh, and they coincide then, and they're boosted by the strategies of coercive exclusion. Um, so that's a big sub thing we need to be thinking about. I don't mean to be pessimistic on all this, by the way, but I'm analyzing from above and where we're at. We, can, we have to be realistic before we can talk about what we do from below, you know, in the face of all of this. Um, and there's another big sub-theme, again, is the unprecedented restructuring of space that I mentioned previously. But we really need to creatively think just how significant this has become, the ability of advanced technologies and new forms of organization to restructure space and function of social control and function of new forms of accumulation and in relation to the crisis. Uh, then I want to reiterate the big sub-theme of the deep racialized dimensions. The example in the U.S. would be, I mean, just one book if you want to look at is The New Jim Crow. Um, uh, yet, and here's the ironic thing, talking about the U.S. or Western Europe, the wages of whiteness are more and more difficult to pay. In the sense that the system in the, in the north, of the, talking about north, south, and the planet, right? The, the north extracted its surplus from the south, from the first world, from the third world, however you want to phrase it, and then redistributed some of that downward to create labor aristocracies and privileged sectors among the, of the working class. And those that those, the, who were privileged within the working class from these colonial relations and neo-colonial relations were white sectors of the working class, and that was the wages of whiteness. But now the material basis for that purchasing, for the paying out wages of whiteness in order to create a labor aristocracy, the material basis are being undermined by the nature of global capitalism. So, so that type of so, so you have this deep racialized dimensions, and yet the, the contradictions that the system has in pushing forward racial class, which is part of global capitalism, and all of them. This leads to the other big sub theme that, again, I'm not developing here, but I have elsewhere, and I'm continuing to to write and think about and speak about is the notion of 21st century fascism. Um, you know, and here I'm not going to end on this note. I'm going to end by seen from below, what do we do in terms of resistance? But I'm ending the view from above here by saying this, that the dystopia of these Hollywood films, you notice this whole spate of Hollywood films have come out with these future dystopias. And when I watch them, I say in part, God, what a nightmare. But on the other part, I say, but 
it's depicting just exaggerated dimensions of what we're actually experiencing. And I'm glad Stephen is here because I keep on forgetting the name of that film about Mexico and the water and the um, sleep, dealer. sleep dealer. Right. You look mm -hmm. at Sleep Dealer. I don't know if you've seen that film. You would def definitely recommend you look at it. Uh, sleep Dealer. You look at this film, Boys to Men, which came out about six, seven years ago. And then you look more recently at the ecliptic. Not a great film, but it, but the rich lived literally, literally above the earth, literally above the planet. And the poor couldn't get up to where the rich were, but had to serve them. Uh, so all of these dystopic films from Hollywood, they're depicting really the same themes that we're looking at in global capitalism and its crisis. So in conclusion then, seen from below, uh, we have all of these challenges. Um, and so what are some of the challenges that we need to be thinking about, researching, writing about, organizing around, et cetera? One is, we need to move, in terms of popular struggles, and this is happening, but too slowly, from national to transnational consciousness. Right? We need to, our working classes need transnational class consciousness. Our social movements need to be transnational social movements, not just coordinate across borders, but organize struggle, uh, have, have transnational projects. Um, we need to resolve the question of, and it's not resolved, the debate is important, but we also um, and, and it continues, relationship between social movements, political organizations, the state, and power. Is that one of the big things is the acknowledgement that states and political organizations corrupt us, so then, therefore we won't touch political organizations. And, and we haven't resolved that. You, if you don't have a political organization that links together the different uh, fronts of struggle of all these different social movements, you can't really challenge the, you know, raise the issue of power and challenging power. Um, then we need our own projects, because not just resistance, I mean, not just reactive resistance, but also proactive, because without your own project, you end up negotiating the terms of the dominant project. And that's not going to resolve our crisis. Um, and then there's the issue of the struggle over the interpretation of the crisis itself. How people understand this crisis, what is at stake, what's the nature of it, is itself part of the struggle around the crisis and the resolution of the crisis, whether it's from above or from below. Um, and then I would suggest also we need to recognize, and again, it's all of this, you know, we're doing, um, but it's part of our solution from below, our response from below, the new face of the global working class. I mean, at one point, the postmodernists were saying there's no more working class as an agent. I don't agree with that in the least, but what I do assert is that the global working class looks nothing like how we depicted it in the, you know, in the mid 20th century or in the 19th century, the global working class is an immigrant working class, it's a female working class, it's a flexibilized working class, it's an informalized working class. Surplus labor is actually part of the global working class, just not being directly, directly, it's labor power exploited by capital. So you know, we need to rethink a global working class as, in all these dimensions, as an agent, as a key agent of, uh, uh, you know, of struggle and of challenging the crisis from below. Uh, and then the call, and I conclude with this, the call that already has gone out, especially from the global environmental movement and the global justice movement, and I simply want to ratify it, the struggle for the global commons, to decommodify uh, more, you know, every single space we can decommodify and turn back into global commons is what we need to do. And in doing that, we need to have uh, link struggles in, in three, on three sites, link them together to the single struggle. Sites of production, you know, classical sites of struggles on the sites of production. Sites of social reproduction, community, family, etc., and sites of marginality, where people have been pushed into the margins. So um, I'll end with that. Thank you.